I feel like I only see you at town halls. The life of a dean. I'll come visit you. I think we're ready, nine o'clock. Hey, good morning, everyone. Woo! Nine o'clock on a Friday and the Hogs won last night. Very exciting, very exciting. Well, welcome everybody. Really, really pleased to be here in our third 150 Forward Strategic Planning Town Hall. Today's topic is one um, that is somewhat new to the university community. We've heard about student success for a while. We've heard about research excellence for a while. For those of you who have kind of been paying attention, employer of choice was something we started talking about just over a year ago. It's pretty young. So I'm expecting a pretty active town hall today because I bet there are a lot of questions out there. The pre-submits show that. Lots of questions. So what I'm gonna have to work hard to do today as a moderator is make sure that we cover as many topics as possible. So if I ask you um, to wait on a question because it's already been addressed, I just want you to be prepared for that. It's not in an effort to um, curb any discussion on any particular issue, but town hall is really our opportunity to hear about the most issues from as many people as possible. Feedback at uark.edu is another vehicle for you to be able to give feedback um, to our community about your concerns about employer of choice. Um, so welcome to all of you. Thank you for taking time to be here, whether it is in person here at the law school or whether it is online. We really appreciate your engagement. Um, as we have done in the past, we're gonna have an overview um, and some updates from our panelists about interesting things that are going on on campus, and then we'll get into the Q&A. And like I said, I have a lot of pre-submits today, uh, so lots of ground to cover, and I'm really excited to be able to do that. Um, so let me introduce our panelists, who I think you all know, you're all stars. <laughs> we have, of course, Chancellor Robinson, Executive Vice Chancellor Aaron Bordelon, Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Terry Martin, really excited for a full community debut for our Chief People Officer, Michelle Wolf, and of course, Anya Zaichek in the Provost's office um, will be uh, able to speak about faculty affairs. Um, so with that, let's just jump right in. Um, Chancellor Robinson, why employer of choice? Why are we talking about it as part of 150 Forward? Thank you, Margaret, and good morning, everyone. Two observations before I start. There's a lot of green in the room. <laughs> <clears throat> I understand that. I'm violating code here today. And, and the other observation is there was a real buzz before we started, and it reminded me of when I was a faculty member and students were in the classroom and we were in the week before spring break. Like everybody was so excited and I, I wanted to believe it was the quality of my lectures, but I had a sense that they were anticipating not having to deal with me for a week. So anyway, welcome. And, and employer of choice is, is important. And it's, yes, we started using the language maybe a year ago, but I, I know from 1999 when I came here that the University of Arkansas has sought to be an employer of choice to some degree. And what we're trying to do is, is to really uh, amp up our efforts to demonstrate that this is, is important to us. So it's not starting from scratch. It's about building on success that we believe we've already uh, had. <clears throat> now, it is about addressing uh, a, a number of things. One, of course, is that we want to make sure that we have competitive salaries for our, our, our workers. Now, competitive means understanding what your markets are and being aligned in a way to strategically um, compete for the best people. Because if you have the best people, as you, I, as I'm assuming you agree, that the best people help to create the, the best execution of po policy and processes so that you can have the best outcomes and the highest outcomes. So we have to put ourselves in a place from a market standpoint where we can compete. Now we have challenges there, as you know, because we are not uh, a corporation in the traditional sense. We have a sensitivity to 
uh, our budgets that are tied to what students have to pay uh, because as we grow our budget, we have to always keep in mind that anything that we charge to students has a negative impact on access. So having real balance in our uh, assessment of budgets is something that we will have a sensitivity to. But it's not just about salary, it's also about the broader reality around working on the campus, how, how you feel valued by the institution, uh, the, the, the life work balance that we can create for you, the greater flexibility in, in how we, we manage work on this campus, and just the overall environment, dealing with issues that matter to you, that I'm sure you will tell us about today, in ways that <laughs> signal to you, yeah, I know we're gonna get it, um, <laughs> in ways that signal to you that you, val you are valuable to us, that, we, that, that you matter. And when people feel and know that they matter to an organization, they tend to give more to that organization than they do otherwise. One of the benefits we have here, and I'll say this and then I'll stop, is that we are a mission-driven institution. And I don't, I mean, mission is not always clear when you work for organizations, but this mission, to me, has a lot of clarity. We are here to serve our campus community, to serve the students who are part of our campus community, to create the opportunity for them to maximize that development and achieve things beyond their wildest imaginations. And each and every one of you plays a role in that. And you may not see it fully blossom, but you know that while you're here, you're playing a role in creating that outcome. And ultimately, our, not just our community, not just you know, our state, but our world is made better, better by the efforts that you give every single day. So that mission, to me, is critical and always remembering that's why we're here, that's why we do what we do. So Margaret. Awesome, thank you for that reminder of mission because it's, it's really important. And then operationalizing mission. Anne, you wanna talk about what it means to be an employer of choice? Yeah, sure. I, um, first of all, everybody, thanks for being here. And Charles, you mentioned that Everyone's out there in green, but I, I didn't wear green today because I didn't feel like I needed any extra luck. <laughs> <laughs> I have skills and experience that I'm relying on. She, she's very confident. <laughs> I'll probably eat those words later today, but uh, hopefully to not in the next there. hour and a half. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, Charles mentioned, you know, I think being an employer of choice is much more than about just what we do here for employees. It's about how we, how we do it, how we make employees feel. Um, we need to cultivate an, an environment and a culture where, where people belong, meaning they feel safe and respected and we're celebrating the unique skills and perspectives that people bring to their job every day, that they're working towards a meaningful purpose that you, that you mentioned. Our mission is mm -hmm. pretty clear but not everybody here on campus probably thinks of themselves as an educator. And uh, in my career at Walmart, over the almost 13 years, I was um, challenged every day to think like a merchant. And I think every day here, I feel like we should challenge ourselves to think like educators, even if we're in a staff role or a support role, not necessarily a faculty or a member or a, research or a researcher. Um, we also want to make sure that people have an opportunity to grow in their current role, whether it's in their current role or in terms of their career, in terms of their progression and long-term growth or advancement. Um, and we want to make sure that people are thriving and making sure that they can be successful both in their personal life and, and in their professional life. Um, today, I think we'll um, discuss a few of our ongoing projects. We'll talk about employee value proposition. We'll talk about the classification and compensation project. We'll talk about flexible work. Um, we'll talk about making your day work through technology or making sure that staff have what they need for success in the classroom and in their labs. Uh, it also uh, includes our existing benefits, talent development and performance management, all of those things create an ecosystem of being an employer of choice. It's not just about pay. 
uh, but pay is an important part, obviously. Um, so as we go through this, I, I, I guess I have to really challenge the, the listeners to really think about how, what they are doing to make a great work environment for, for the people that we've given, entrusted them with the responsibility of supervising. Um, our leaders at, at all levels in the organization really set that tone for being an employer of choice. It's not just an, it's not just an HR thing. It's every, everyone who is a manager or a supervisor has that responsibility um, to, to make their uh, employees uh, make, feel like th that uh, the university is a great place to work. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of research out there that shows that uh, the most important thing in making an employee sticky in an organization is how they feel at work and, and the connection to their team and to their, uh, uh, their peer group. And so I think that's really important. I mean, that, that ranks way higher than pay. Now, I'm not dismissing the importance of pay. I'm just suggesting that there are many indicators that uh, contribute to, to being an employer of choice. And we're only gonna become an employer of choice with everybody's help and everybody's advocacy and support of all of these initiatives that we're, that we're undertaking. So we look forward to our uh, collaboration across campus as we uh, uh, go through the class and comp prom proposition. You'll be hearing more about employee value proposition and, and some of the other things that we're working on. Great. Well, um, I now, as I said earlier, get to introduce um, Michelle Hargis Wolf, who is our chief people officer. Well, for, you know, I wanted to, before I let Michelle talk, because she can talk on her own. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about why, why we hired Michelle. Um, she, she joined the university in February. Um, she has quite a, a long history of transformation. Um, she has experience in just about every uh, aspect of human resources. Uh, I think she also has um, more recently been in much broader business roles, which helps her really, I think, understand, or creates capability, obviously, for her to understand the business of being in higher ed. It's, it's obviously different than the environment that she came from, but, but I think her uh, learning agility is, is pretty high, and I, I don't doubt that uh, she'll be able to pick it up quickly, as she's already proven. Um, and I think she's gonna be leading um, two of the foundational pieces of this work, um, with the employee value proposition first, first and then also um, from a leadership perspective, the, the classification and compensation project. But I really look forward to, she's a highly collaborative person. You, she's not gonna be sitting in her office, she's gonna be out on campus. Uh, there's been a, uh, out with a lot of outreach, which I know is already starting. So um, I know that uh, we can look forward to a lot of collaboration from Michelle. Welcome. Thank you. Woo! Yeah, and, and just a note, because I, I think um, mm -hmm. we, we have to remember this. W when is it? It's March. It's March 17th, yeah, and you arrived that? in February. 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 So um, just keep that in mind as Michelle um, introduces us to Employee Value Proposition and talks about the Class Comp Project. Yes, Take thank it away. you, thank mm -hmm. you, Margaret, thank you, Ann, thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here today, Friday before spring break. I am so excited to be here. I was reminded by the unit where you get to buy your plaque on the sidewalk where they rub your name, uh, that my name has been there a really long time. Uh, <laughs> But I am so excited to be back on campus. I am an alum and uh, to be hired and jump into meaningful work, uh, inheriting a fantastic team. Already I wanna thank, like Ann said, I've been out on campus, I've been meeting with a lot of different groups, collaborating, gaining insights. Thank you for welcoming me the way that you have and sharing and collaborating and we're gonna get to work on some very important projects. And so the first that I wanna talk about is related, as Ann mentioned, these two to tied to our strategic pillar of being an employer of choice. The first is around our employee value proposition, otherwise known as EVP. And what that is, as we started our overall strategic plan for our 150 forward planning sessions, our 150 year forward, 
we partnered with a higher educational research institution that is experienced with higher ed and healthcare with respect to looking and helping us with employee value proposition. And what that is, is how you feel that it's that soft stuff. Why do you come to work? What is that reward? And you, you hear it all the time. It's about impact. It's about purpose. It's about serving. We're certainly here likely having a lot of similarities, but we are partnering with EAB, this um, college uh, higher ed research institute, to dive deeper into what that means. You hear, I want to come to the University of Arkansas because I feel like I belong. But the next steps that we're going to go, what does that mean to you? What does it feel like? And then those words that we gather from this work that's coming next will tie to how we attract our talent based on our job postings, our job descriptions. And then we're going to look at actually, this is going to be your environment. These words and what our environment is, this employee value proposition that's going to make our employees want to stay, and it's also going to attract new employees. Uh, the words are going to come from you, and then you're going to be helping us create that culture and, in, and holding us accountable to the culture and the environment that you've identified that you want. And so that is a huge initiative mm -hmm. as the foundation um, for establishing our employee value proposition to bring and attract talent, to retain the best talent, uh, as Chancellor and Ann were saying. And then the um, we've had the leadership discussions, as I mentioned, to start to see where employees are identifying their value. We have already identified that careers are very important. The purpose of the work that you're serving, the work environment in which you work, obviously, and the people that you get to work with every day, like a family. And so as we continue to gather this information, like I said, we will build out what that employee value proposition is. It will go through everything. Um, through the career paths, our job postings, your job descriptions, and we're so excited about this mm -hmm. one uh, foundational project. And the next one that I know you really wanted me to get to is around classification and compensation. So as I mentioned on the EVP, the Employee Value Proposition work, one of the things that we are hearing, of course, is around career and pay and those paths to promotion, to advancement, to growth, to development. And so um, it's very important to whether people accept certain jobs, whether they come and work at the university, and the environment has changed. Uh, it's a very competitive environment, much more competitive than it has been in the past, and the world uh, has changed the way we work as well uh, since COVID. And so becoming um, an employer of choice has to be foundational and getting the compensation and classification right is critical. And so uh, I don't underestimate that as I do come in new to the role. Fortunately, I do have experience with the compensation piece and analyzing data. We have partnered with another organization that has access to specialized data in the fields, not only locally, regionally, um, but also with respect to trades, specialized skills. And so what is that data out there that we should be comparing ourselves to? And then what ultimately will come from that is a structure, a structure that you're able to see. Um, we will look and ensure that we are market competitive across the board, and then what we're doing right now is defining the work. So there have been subject matter experts identified by every unit across the campus. We've been meeting with them, and they have been talking about the work. I know that there are some questions about job titles. That's too early to talk about job titles. We're not talking about reorganization in any way. We want to show you the work so that you see the opportunity that is across campus and how you can grow from one skill set to the next. 
even on career paths that you don't have any experience with. And so we are extremely excited about getting that classification and compensation study, and that will progress on as we now go into looking at from um, the subject matter experts looking at the job profiles. And again, more to come. Awesome, thank you. That's a tremendous amount of work in a short period of time. So we're, we're glad you're here. Thank you. Um, and as, uh, as I know you told the search committee, this is your dream job. Um, and that's really exciting too. Somebody wants to come to the university and really help us figure out everything you just said for everyone's benefit. And I know we have some questions about uh, that we'll get to uh, for, for the provost and his office about faculty and compensation, but in just a minute, because I get to jump in the queue. Um, I'm excited about this. Um, a year ago, and it seems like a long time ago, but a year ago, you may recall that perhaps you did not know whether you could have flexibility in your schedule at work. In fact, you may not have had flexibility in your schedule at work. And I give huge credit to our chancellor and, and to Anne um, for understanding how important it was that we explore what does remote and flex work mean to the University of Arkansas a mission-driven organization, residential, higher ed, um, growing the young minds of Arkansas and beyond, and what kind of support do they need around them. But thanks to the task force on remote and flex work, in a year's time, we've been able to pilot over the summer and then pilot it during the academic year. What does it look like to actually have remote and flexible options on campus? Like, we did it, folks. That's, just not the, that's not just leadership and the task force. That is people saying, we want to try this. This is important to us. We will take the risk of having maybe some friction, maybe some misunderstandings, maybe some learning happening. Um, and the task force, I think, was really thoughtful about that. So I'm really excited to share with everybody that we will take our pilots and our next step is to make remote or flexible work, and I'll talk about what that is very briefly, a permanent feature of the University of Arkansas. Um, so a lot of credit to people in the room who were willing to take that risk and make it work. So what does that actually mean? We want to continue the primary features of the pilots. So right now, there are essentially three options. You can have hybrid work, which means you may be working from home a few days a week. You know we recommend no more than two. Sometimes three makes sense in your office. There needs to be a business case for that. You have flexible hours. You may be coming in a little bit early, leaving a little bit early. You may be providing an opportunity for a student to take care of something because you do come in a little bit earlier in the morning and you can meet that student. Though you might be more likely to catch them at the end of the day. Um, and some of you are doing that as well. Um, and then the third piece is some compressed schedules. You work four days a week. You can work four tens. Um, and and those have, those, all of those three options will be on the table going forward under these conditions. Your unit leader has to be able to support flexibility in your area. I'll give you an example. Athletics, they want to be flexible. However, football season is not the best time to have a lot of flexibility. <laughs> and so they don't. But we need to give them the flexibility to meet the needs of their audience and of their workforce. So maybe in the fall it's not so flexible in athletics. Maybe that's in the summer. The other thing is managers. Managers being able to work with employees and have those conversations, we would continue to have that as a feature of flexible work, meaning your first stop is with your manager to talk about what schedule works for you and for the team. We've heard a lot about we're a team here at the University of Arkansas. Um, and that's probably one of the areas in which we've heard the most friction during the pilots. Some managers may not be that supportive of flexibility. Well, our question now is how can we support the campus in understanding the benefits and sometimes the risks that come with flex work? So as we move towards a new year, July 1 new year, we'll be working on um, permanency, and it will include training resources for folks. And I'm going to call out Ashley Ingram for uh, her team being able to prepare and put in workday training that will be made available both for managers and for employees to try to support a common understanding of the expectations around flexible work and how we can make it work. So I see this as a huge win 
for campus. Um, and it took a lot of people, again, willing to experiment. But I, it all comes with a caveat. Nobody's figured out the workplace post-pandemic yet. We don't know. Um, a lot of people wanted to be 100% remote. Well, 100% remote is going to continue to be in a different category. There's employment law. There's some tax limitations. There are other challenges to being 100% remote. Does that mean it's off the table? No. Does it mean that it requires more scrutiny and careful analysis? Yes. So it's going to go on a different path, um, as it has been from the start. So I'm really excited to say that um, as we think about being an, an employer of choice, we're being thoughtful about what the American workplace looks like and how we can support you in thriving. And as I was thinking about today's town hall, I recalled a conversation that I had with someone just recently who said, I really love flex work. I feel like I can breathe. And I was like, oh wow, that's, that's pretty powerful. That simple statement was really powerful. And if you can breathe, you're probably feeling better during the day about your work, about the people you're working with, and what your whole life looks like. And so those are the kinds of things that are possible if we work together as we figure out employer of choice together. So I was excited to share that with you. And I know we're trying a lot of other experimentation. And Anne, I wanted to ask you about making your day work. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot goes into being an employer of choice. And one of those things is, are, are, we, are we making it easy for you to do your job? Are, are you, uh, in your job, are you focused on the highest value add activities or are you doing a lot of low value paper pushing or maybe you have 150 e inbox items in workday? Um, you know, I, so we really want to focus on how do we streamline people's jobs in a way that helps them focus on the value add activity and feel more connected to the actual purpose of the university versus you know, low value activities. And so um, as we have um, transitioned away from, you know, an implementation state with Workday, we took that opportunity to um, really think about um, the support that we offer, not just in Workday, but in business process in general. And so James Morrison, I see you hiding back there. Uh, wait, hold your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. Uh, James is leading uh, the uh, work, uh, the um, user support and experience group, and um, they have uh, a heavy focus on workday. But it's not just about workday. As you know, workday is only as good as the business processes that it sits on top of. And we know um, from our implementation and from some of our ongoing optimization and enhancements that we have a lot of work to do as it relates to our business process. And so James and his team that has been slowly built over the last few months um, is really focused on, on this effort. Um, he's helping us prioritize where we can get the most uh, um, uh, the most bang for the effort and prioritizing uh, all the things that we, we, we need to be working on in terms of, uh, in terms of um, uh, process efficiency and, and streamlining. Um, he's been a great uh, a filter for us with Project One in that effort. Uh, I know Project One uh, thinks very highly of James and, and, and the work and the team and the work that's going on there, um, because I think we're all gonna uh, have a, a lot more clarity about what's being worked on and what is actually happening. Um, I know that James, you and your team have been meeting across campus for a while now, uh, getting back and getting uh, uh, some insight into what people are really experiencing in their day-to-day -day jobs, and, I, and I, um, I know that we're gonna have some some wins here over this next year for sure, and we already have had some. Um, and, and by the way, it's, I just want, beyond even James's team, um, in some of these other initiatives, we're really incorporating that into, um, in, into this work. Margaret, you, you and I have been working with Huron in, in um, the, the OSP, mm -hmm. And there's a big workday component of that work, um, and they have—I mean, they're—they're they're an—they're almost an extension of, 
of James's staff in some ways, and, able, and they have experts in that field, in that area, that have really helped lift uh, some of the process there already. Um, we'll be doing the same thing with our, our partners on the classification and compensation, because we don't always know how to best utilize Workday, and these groups do. They have, they have been uh, working with Workday much longer than we have, and they have a lot of uh, uh, advice and counsel to share for us so that we, we can um, forgo some, some mistakes that we might make had we gone it alone. So I look forward to uh, that ongoing effort, and I just want to reemphasize, it's not just about Workday. Um, it really is about the, biggest, the bigger business processes and making sure that we can get the most out of your work day um, so that you're, that you, you, again, you're feeling like you're working on things that really matter and you feel more connected to uh, delivering on that student success and, and research imperative that we have. That's great. Thank you for that. And yes, thank you, James. Another newer hire since October um, hit the ground running. And also just want to call out Janelle Colbert-Diaz, that many of you know is our HCM lead. And just in the interest of town hall, sharing some early wins that also have involved Lisa Milam and others. When we did the listening tour in the fall, what we heard from our employees is we can't hire like hourly people or adjuncts are so slow. And I'll share a very quick vignette. Um, in my other role, Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation, Julia helped me hire an hourly employee. And if it had been in the fall, nobody in some of our listening to our meetings would have believed that we could do it in about 72 hours um, from start to finish with, a, with a, a, a student hire that we really needed in the division. And because people listened to campus, understood those frustrations, Janelle and Lisa got to work on how do we make evergreen hiring easier, quicker. And I didn't even realize it until we had actually pressed submit and onboarded somebody that like these were the two pieces of my world coming together. And I thought about the people it took and the listening and the getting to work and the working day after day, just kind of one step at a time to make things better. And again, it takes all of us to engage in that process of continuous improvement and saying, well, I wonder if Evergreen could be even better. I wonder if we could do it in 24 hours by the fall. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Um, but so there's a lot of exciting work going on. And again, going back to what I said at the beginning, employer of choice can be, is a newer concept for our campus. And it's a work in progress, and I think it should always be a work in progress too, right? We can always reflect on culture and what we want from our workplace and how we are educators and what does that mean in terms of leadership on campus, no matter what job you do. Speaking of jobs you do, I want to turn now to you, Provost Martin. Um, we've heard a lot about class comp and that being focused on staff. And we have a number of questions today that are related to the concept of what about faculty when we're thinking about compensation, because I think you already have a classification system. Yes, we've uh, uh, realized when we started this that we would be needing to look at faculty salaries. Uh, we. I guess it was about a year ago, I followed up with a study that Provost Gaber had started when she was the, uh, serving as provost here. She looked at the faculty salaries and we found that at almost all levels, we were below what our benchmark peer group uh, was at. And so she implemented several things. There were some pay raises for different groups in that over the years. And uh, so I followed back up with that exact group, benchmark group, and looked at it. And over those years, we have caught up and closed that gap at the university level. And so we are at the level, at that point, we were okay. And uh, so I said, we've got to now get down to looking at the departmental level. And so that's a study that we're going to do on the heels of the uh, comp and classification study. We're going to continue with the, uh, the group that we have outside and looking at those salaries down to the departmental level. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to trying to get into that because I tried to look at it from the standpoint of what the same data set that we have, but when for Provost Gaber, but it does not go to the departmental level. So we have to change databases and look at other areas. But we will be taking a look at that. The classification, you know, we're pretty set, as, as Margaret said. We have 
as far as faculty, we know what classifications are. We have assistant associate, full professor, distinguished instructors, lecturers. Those are pretty well known. Uh, but the compensation part, we will be taking at. Terrific. Thanks for clarifying that for the faculty community. Another question that comes up um, for you, Anya, which is a great synthesis of kind of two strategic pillars, which is research excellence and employer of choice. We have a, a number of questions around like, how important is research in the hiring process? And I know you're often looking at hiring plans, and um, we also have some deans in the room as well that we might call on for an answer. But from your point of view, where does research fit in hiring? Is it that important, I think, is the kind of underlying question. <clears throat> so good morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, first of all, <laughs> I would like to, I always like to connect with the people that I have a pleasure uh, speaking with. So I want to acknowledge that I see many von wonderful faces in the audience. And I wanted to say hi to everybody that I know and hi to everybody that I do not know. But I do know that I know the majority of people here. So thank you for being <laughs> here. Thank you for being awesome. here. So uh, going to the question of research, uh, I happen to be a professor of sociology and uh, I value research a lot. And, uh, and I love research. I don't mm -hmm. only value research, uh, I love research and I love doing research. Now, as an educational institution with a land-grant mission, we are about many different things, research being one of those. So, of course, we want to hire great researchers who can move forward innovation, discovery, creativity, but also we need excellent teachers that are going to educate our students for student success. And we also need to hire people who will be also willing to carry the everyday job or work of serving on different committees and doing other things in service so we can get our jobs done day in and day out. I mean, I cannot emphasize enough the value of the service that not only staff but faculty and also students do every day to support the mission of our university. So yes, research is critical but other things are very important as well. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you a quick follow-up on that when, because you, you talked about, right, the three pillars of a traditional tenure line, that teaching, that research, that service. How about folks that are thinking about department chair? What, what you know, when they're thinking about, I might wanna be promoted, what are the skill sets that we think we might be looking for in the future of department chairs? Do they have to have the best research portfolio, the best teaching, the best service? What are you looking for? Okay, so let me actually put oh. my pro <laughs> boss on You're gonna the kick spot. that over to the boss, okay. <laughs> and then I'll also okay. say something. Sure, you know, it's uh, as far as a department chair, department head, uh, you're, it's not necessarily that you have to be the best researcher. You have to have the skills to do what's necessary in the job. And sometimes the, you know, to me, the best department chairs are the ones and department heads are people that can evaluate. One of the things you have to do is evaluate promotion and tenure. And certainly you have to be able to do that. And if professorial, if you're a professor, you have established that you've done the necessary research, you've done the creative works, what it takes in your department, your area to be able to do those. And I think those, uh, having achieved that rank of professor is the best to me, ones that serve the best and are able to do that without having any kind of conflicts or concerns that put in awkward situations. Great, thank you. Any more? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So, um, you know, for me, every uh, unit on our campus, including departments, these are like mini organizations that uh, contribute to the overall goal of the university, to the mission. 
And uh, at the beginning, Anne talked about the kind of key principles of being the employer of choice, right? The environment where everyone belongs, that we have the tools to work toward a meaningful purpose and enjoy it and accomplish it, that will be important, and uh, grow and advance and thrive. So when I think about the job of the department chair, department head, or school director, I think about how this person can and is able to, has the competency to actually create this mini work environment, mini organizational environment in their own departments. So this kind of goes into some kind of key characteristics perhaps, and let me just list a few. I'm not, you know, when you look at the job description for the department chair, it's probably longer than for the chancellor and the provost. Let me just say it. <laughs> <laughs> probably not, but okay. <laughs> but I said it, okay? Probably, but and I it said was it. recorded, so yes, you may okay. not be able to live this one down. <laughs> okay. Depart and the department head and chair is probably a much harder job. Too. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. But, 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 but kind of let me kind of go back to kind of having those kind of uh, skills, right, or competencies that are really critical in terms of what Anne talked about. So uh, building and leading an interdependent, productive, diverse and complex community. I mean, it takes some specific skills. Representing and advocating for resources, developing and evaluating others, and also the self, right? I mean, we as leaders, we need to be self-aware and also invest in our own self-development. And leading strategically and managing change uh, so that uh, we can all kind of move forward in a way that is not stressful to people and in a way that is uh, really productive and inclusive, so. Excellent, well thank you thank both you. Um, for answering that, that faculty um, perspective question. We're now gonna move into um, a number of our pre-submitted questions that largely, um, I would say, fall into a couple categories just so our panel is ready. A lot of questions about compensation a lot of questions about beyond compensation, meaning you know, what is there other than um, the paycheck that might be part of employer of choice, and then some culture questions. Um, and then we'll have time for questions from our audience. So um, I wanted to start with um, going back to the compensation question. We have a number of questions that would like a little more detail on that. And you mentioned data, Michelle. How, how do we actually get to compensation? Can you be a little more granular? What is it that Huron will actually do? Um, let's say I am an admin too right now. And you said it's focused on the work, but I think a lot of people are interested in, okay, I get that part, but how are you gonna figure out the compensation piece and, and what's Huron gonna be doing to work through that question? Whoop, now am I live? Yep. Thank you. Huron, as I mentioned, has experience. They have tremendous sets of data, very specialized data with respect to virtually every position in higher ed, in healthcare, in the industry, in the specialized trades, specialized skills. Once they understand what the work is, these databases contain descriptions of work. And that then goes to titles, which we'll get to at some point. But within this data and the titles and the type of work that's done in these databases, it provides a structure that you'll be able to see, again, bucketing the work, I should say, mm -hmm. that's similar and compensation data comes with these titles in these databases and that is why we've made such a significant investment in time and resources to get this right um, because there is so much there. 
So I hear it's, da it's data-based, meaning yes. that you know, Huron isn't just a company that kind of behind the curtain is going to say, this is what it is. You'll actually know what those data sets are, what the geography is, and what the comparable positions are across that professional job family. That's great. Perfect. Margaret, yeah. I'd just add that um, you know, the, the, we are also making an investment long term to, to have access to this data beyond the 18 months of this, con, this agreement with Huron. So I mean, we will be investing in our own data sets uh, to support the work going on. So this isn't something that um, just is a one and done. Um, it, it will allow us as jobs change or jobs uh, or new jobs arise that we can um, have good data-based uh, decisions about what the compensation for those jobs should be as they change or, or are identified. Great, thank you for that. This is um, a follow-up, um, same thing, compensation. I think we've known for quite some time there's concern across our community about um, are lower paying positions um, and whether one can live on that salary. Um, tough issue to acknowledge and then to kind of begin to think about. So we have that, that question and then also a question that I think is related to moving from classified to non-classified and the term compression, salary compression. Um, I said this a few times. It's not just one answer. I think it'd be helpful for the community to understand how we think about those very challenging issues. Anne, you want to take the lead on that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'll take the living wage, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, just as I arrived on uh, campus a couple of two and a half, almost three years ago now, not quite, um, Chancellor Steinmetz had had um, a plan to raise the living wage to thir to thirty thousand dollars. We were ahead of most of our peer institutions in the SEC by doing that. Um, today, most of them have uh, either have a plan to to be at uh, thirty thousand, or um, or they have recently implemented one. Um, I think there's there's probably a handful of institutions who haven't. But, but most of them have. Um, so we were ahead of the curve in, in that respect. Um, I, you know, we've been for the last three years going through a process with the support of our government affairs uh, people and our, and our peer institutions in the state to um, get our, all of our positions um, moved from classified to non-classified. So at the end of this, this, beginning of next fiscal year, there will be no uh, uh, classified positions on campus. Um, yeah, we can have a round of applause for that, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, that's great work. And, um, mm -hmm. and we took those opportunities to evaluate pay of, of positions as we've done that. The last tranche is, of positions, I think there's 650-ish uh, positions um, that are in the process of being converted this July 1st, and I think conversations are going on with the individual units about the impact uh, of, of that of that change, and um, it's a very positive impact. Uh, we've, I think, over the I don't remember the exact number, but over the three years, I'm pretty sure we've we've invested in the millions in uh, that conversion um, across campus. Um, so, you know, I th and, and as part of that, in at least those positions, we have addressed um, compression. And we've done that by understanding how long somebody has been in their position and we have given them credit, additional credit for being, you know, time and position. And so that's factored into these decisions. I, I don't know exactly how, what implementation of this classification and compensation um, will be yet. Uh, I uh, assume that we will um, have some kind of a mechanism to address compression. Compression's hard, though. I mean, it, it, I, I've said it since day one, I, since I arrived here. Compression exists everywhere. It's not just in higher ed. It's something that every business or any, any, any organization that pays employees deals with compression, especially in an inflationary environment. 
And so it's something that is not going to go away. It's going to be a constant challenge for us. And I just want to make sure people realize that, that, that I'm managing expectations. It's, compression doesn't ever go away. It will all, unless we're in a deflationary environment, I don't see that coming anytime soon. So, um, I, so I, I do think that uh, we, we need to be smart about, as we go through this classification and compensation, that we really under, that we make good decisions on the front side about what implementation looks, or not, what post-implementation looks like. What does it look like in year two or year three? And how do we, you know, and so that we're thinking beyond just this implementation and can be out in front of some of those things and can message now about what those will look like. I don't have those answers right now because we haven't gotten far enough along in the project yet, but we will definitely be communicating um, over, the, over the next several months about how, how that is shaping up. Thanks, Ann. I think uh, I hope everybody really um, appreciated that answer of a tough issue, which is it's a work, it's a constant, and it exists everywhere, and <coughs> that we're talking about it and acknowledging those two things, I think, is a great uh, benefit to the campus because it's not mysterious anymore, which is good. All right, next round of questions are about um, kind of beyond compensation. I'm going to talk, we'll ask you what is there out there for employer of choice beyond compensation. I uh, also want to ask about, um, as we go through looking at the work, I've got a number of questions about this. Um, what's March 31st? It's the day evals are due. <laughs> and so I have a lot of questions coming in about evaluation, and you two mentioned faculty evaluation, actually. So I think there's a lot of interest in, in that topic. Um, and then I'm going to circle back on um, also some concerns I'm seeing in the questions that are about like this, this sounds great, We're really excited that the university is thinking about employer of choice, but aren't we part of a system and what about policy and how does policy change if we need it to? But let's start first with um, maybe Michelle take a first pass at beyond compensation. When we think about what sometimes is referred to as total rewards, but and the EVP kind of, how are we thinking about beyond compensation as part of employer of choice? Getting used to the mic. Yeah. <laughs> we are listening, and as you talk about the environment that you work in, yes, compensation is a part of it, uh, benefits. Um, the environment that we work in, as we've talked about before, the people. And so these listening sessions and even some of the questions that have come in talk about benefits that we may not have today, uh, interest in other types of benefits um, that are innovative, modern edge, how are we going to attract talent with those. This access to the database or in general, not even to the database, but what is out there in the industry, that's what's going to drive the, a regular review. This whole purpose is to create a structure so that we are able and disciplined to remain competitive. And so the total rewards part of that uh, won't just be about compensation. Mm -hmm. Right. It'll be right. about everything, total package, total rewards. Go ahead, Ann. Yeah, I'd just add on to that, just again, to manage people's expectations. We've got to focus first on the classification and compensation and, and get comfortable with where we are with that. Um, I completely agree with Michelle that all of those things, whether it's tuition remission, um, paid time off, parental leave, child care, ed elder care, all of the you name it, vacation days, whatever it is. Um, all of those things are a big component here. Um, we can't just evaluate all of that in the next 12 months. So um, I, I do think we've got to prioritize. Um, we're going to focus on classification and compensation first. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't take up some of these things. And we actually are, I mean, we ha actually have some discussions about some of these other topics on a regular basis. Uh, without actually having a specific project about them. Um, I will say that the system has taken a, um, a uh, there's a, a working group on paid time off and thinking about what does that look like in the future in our, in, across our system. So it's not just here at, at our uh, 
institution, the system office is also taking a lead in, in, in looking at things as well. So Anne, I think you're starting to get into that, um, that third question that I had was just kind of about policy change. And can, can any of you help or each of you help our community understand kind of what is in our UAF control in terms of policy and then the system what, where they influence, not at a granular level, but that right. I think that there's a, a question about that out there, but well, what can we really do? We're part of a larger system. Well, I think obviously we have campus policies that we have a lot of um, opportunity to influence and, and shape. Um, there is a set of um, system policies and a set of board policies, and then there's a state, regu state regulation that sits, that sits at an even higher level. And um, wh while we have the ability to influence and change things at our campus level, um, there's a different uh, socialization and influencing process for the system level and the um, board level. And then, of course, state regulations is, is a whole other thing. So, um, you know, as we undertake a lot of these big projects, we always have a policy work stream. Um, w which we include uh, subject matter experts, we include our legal uh, team involved in that to help us navigate some of those um, challenges and making sure that we're, w as we're making decisions, we're not uh, in conflict with uh, system or, or board policy. But that also doesn't mean that we can't influence those policies um, if, if, if we can certainly um, prove that they're um, a benefit to doing that and a lot of times we'll engage with our uh, sister campuses um, either within the system or if it's a something much broader than that even across the state um, to to work together to to influence those great thank you last question um, from our pre-submits is again about evaluations um, and the, the the questions have a couple of different aspects to them um, but I think one of the most important is, is the classification and compensation focusing on the work going to change the way we do evaluations? And then the other set might be more of, how does our leadership team think about evaluations? What's your aspiration for that annual event on campus? You're shaking your head yes. You want to take that first, Michelle, or no? I'll, I'll take it. Okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Only, only because I, you know, she's only been here for six weeks, so, and I've been here for, uh, this is my third evaluation cycle, so. <laughs> I will say, I hope it changes the evaluation process. Um, now, that's, but, but I go back to this classification and compensation is a foundational part of an entire employee experience ecosystem, so to speak. I mean, talent development, talent management, those are all things that are, are part of that. And you can't have good talent management and good talent development without a great feedback process. And that feedback process has to be fair, it has to be candid, it has to be honest, because people really want to know how they're doing. Um, they don't don't want to just hear the good stuff. I mean, I personally want to know if I have a shortcoming. I'd like to know about that because I want to rectify that. And if people are walking around in, in uncertainty, that's not fair to them. Mm -hmm. If people don't know how they're doing, it's not fair to them as an employee. And so I think having, now does that mean we have one evaluation process that spans every job? Probably not. I mean, I think we have to have different kinds of evaluation processes depending on the, the, the I mean, an employee, a uh, faculty evaluation is different than a staff evaluation. Mm -hmm. An evaluation of a senior leader is different than a, than a manager or a frontline worker. Those are all, those all have to be a little bit different. We need to put some real thought into what those look like. What are we going to hold people accountable for at different levels? And, um, and then, you know, and then how is that tied or not tied to pay? You know, some, some organizations have completely d um, separated feedback from pay. It sounds weird, but, but, but that, is, that is something that's going on out, out, outside of higher ed and maybe even, but I don't know. Um, but but there is a there is a personally for me I can't speak for 
anyone else on the panel, but personally for me, I think we have a whole lot so that our, uh, our employees are getting great feedback so that we can help them grow their career and help them advance their career. Yeah. Provost Martin, I see you shaking your head yes. I want to give you an opportunity. Yes, with the faculty, I think we have similar uh, concerns that we want to provide good feedback uh, to faculty uh, in, in all aspects and we gather feedback from a variety of places uh, and it's very difficult, uh, I think, uh, but we do have uh, some changes and things that I think we need to take a look at and how it, it, maybe it's training, uh, but it's, I think the important thing is, as Ann said, uh, the employee deserves a good feedback, a good uh, evaluation of where they stand, how their performance is. Excellent, thank you. Um, before we get to um, our, you know, kind of in-room or online, again, feedback at uark.edu questions, um, I just want to have a little bit of audience participation. Um, how many of you, raise your hand, think this is a large organization? Okay, everybody. How many people think it's a complex organization? Oh, everybody, those are quicker hands. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm hearing. There's a lot of complexity, um, an employer of choice in particular. And something I wanted to kind of lift up um, from today's discussion and our prior two discussions is the role of data and data-driven decision making, being part of a transition that campus is making. Because when you're large and complex, can't always get out and have a town hall. And we don't have a town hall that includes every person, but we often do have data. And so I just want to share with our community that um, part of strategic planning, keep your eyes out for some forums, uh, are on topics that came up in town hall, and one of them will be data strategy. How do we use data on campus? How does it drive decision making? How can we make sure that we have best practices in kind of using our data to support not only our understanding of the community, some of the issues that may exist, how we can be more efficient because we understand where perhaps the data shows we are not performing well. Um, so I did want to put that out there because I heard a lot about data from this group today. And I think it's really exciting to think about um, how a big, large, complex organization can use its data to help us perform and to help all of us as employees understand the context in which we operate. Again, large, complex organization. Um, so with that, um, I would like to take some questions from our audience. Susan, I'm going to have you wait for a mic. Here comes Lo Logan with a mic. two questions, one for, um, I'll address this one to Anne and one to Michelle. Um, I'm in Anne's organization, and so on the staff side, and so I'd like for you to comment further, particularly th for those who are in finance and administration who are not on the academic side of the house and don't often engage with our students directly, um, how you would, if you were, had your organization in front of you, how would you tell us to think like an educator? And to uh, Michelle, we're talking about data-driven decisions that Margaret was just discussing. And you were also talking about listening and determining employee value proposition. And much of that, as we know, as Anne even mentioned, is not all tied to compensation. There are a lot of intangibles, the soft, squishy stuff. How are we going to define those metrics? How are we going to define that in terms of data? I'll let you guys She's fight over, over there. there. <laughs> writing down her notes to answer your question, Susan. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, th I think about this a lot. I mean, I think about people in my organization. Um, I think of Scott, I think about your team and, um, you know, you, how you keep our build, buildings up, you keep our grounds up, you, make, um, you keep hazards out of the way uh, when it, we have inclement weather. And I think about that, that allows people to get around campus in, in a safe way so they can attend their classes, so they can um, enjoy student life. And uh, you know, I, there, there's so many ways you make our, uh, you with us, Steve Krogel's team, make, make our uh, classrooms technologically enabled. 
uh, so that we can deliver classes in the format that we need with the, with, the, with the technology that we need in those classrooms. Susan, I think when I think about the financial affairs team, I think about um, uh, student accounts and how uh, we can um, make, a, make that experience um, good for our students and their parents when they're paying their tuition uh, and their bills, but I also think about all the money that, uh, that we have uh, in our bank accounts um, that you're investing, and because you're investing it wisely, um, that's allowing us to fund uh, projects that we have um, where, where we, do, uh, we, we don't uh, speculate uh, in the market. Um, we have a very robust investment policy. Um, I think we um, are doing what we can with all of that, with the, the cash that we have so that we can hold down the cost of education for people. I think, we, and we also run a very lean ship uh, in finance. Um, so, you know, it's not always that clear, direct relationship, but I think we can always figure out what is that, what is that way that we're, um, what, what is that connection to the, to the campus mission? And that's really my challenge, is for us to figure it out. I mean, I can think about, Bridget, I mean, you, you're, you're, you're running, I don't even, 7,000, 8,000 pay, payroll checks every, make sure that our employees are getting paid so they can deliver on that student success and that research initiative and, and the support people that are here. I mean, all of, those, all of these things are important. And, and we couldn't be successful in delivering the education to our students or the research on this campus without all of these roles. Mm -hmm. and, I, and again, I think as leaders of our organization, I, I challenge you to sit down with your team and talk about why is your role important on this campus? And if you can't answer that question, maybe we don't need the role. <laughs> I mean, seriously, yeah. we should wow. be able to say why that role is important. And if we mm -hmm. cannot connect it to a student serving or research mission, we don't probably need that role. And let me pick up on that um, based on something you said earlier too, is just because we may not need a role doesn't mean we don't need you. But meaning that there are growth opportunities. Um, if we still had somebody, let's say, selling, um, I don't know, something that we don't do anymore, film, right? You were, the, you were in charge of film. You probably don't have a job today um, unless you're working with digital media and you've grown. You've grown from the film stage. So I think it's really, really wise to say, challenge us to think about the work. And, but also know that we have recognized through employer of choice that this university runs on people and that people are what move us forward. And I hear the chancellor talk about that a lot. And, and you just re made me recall that when we talked about student success town hall, we talked about mentorship and thinking about each of us as a mentor to the young people, the juniors um, who have just joined us in staff roles or faculty roles, and how we conduct ourselves um, helps model and educate others about what it means to be part of a community and something, again, that you say, Chancellor, striving, right? Striving for that, that breakthrough in your learning, in your research, in your work um, is something that comes from questioning, but also knowing that every day all that we do is really mentorship um, for our students, but also um, for those who are new to our community, which makes me turn it back to you on Susan's second question. When we think about data and EVP and how do you kind of capture sentiment and measure it, what are we thinking there? Most of the time, you measure with surveys. And so once we complete the definitions, what do you collectively want to see in your environment once we get those words generated? Uh, then we're going to want to measure it. Uh, do you feel uh, included? Do you feel a sense of belonging? Uh, do you feel the ability to make an impact? And so being able to measure with surveys it's called the applicant experience, the employee experience. It's all around the user experience. While that's a new type term, you have to get to what that experience is and measuring it generally.
through the surveys, and so that's, that's what I'm after to enhance the experience and then measuring is it working. That's great, thank you. That, a good follow-up. Um, who else? Who else has a question today? Down here in the front, Logan. That's okay. <laughs> You'll be fine. I just have a question concerning if we become non-classified July 1st. Will we, staff, be able to request raises? And can departmental funds be used to have for staff bonuses? Or is that going to have to be part of the compensation part that we would have to wait for? Or is that going to be left up to Central to bring it down to the individual colleges like Fulbright Engineering? Great question. Here, I'll take that back. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll start off, and Lisa and uh, yeah. others might help, help <laughs> me if I, if I don't give the full answer. But So as people are moving from class to non-class, we've already done an evaluation of what that means in terms of bringing those individual salaries up to some uh, market um, data that we that we have now every everyone else every individual may be in a different place relative to that market and so um, so the facts around and your on your specific situation is individual to you and what your current compensation is in in relation to how long you've been in your position and um, and uh, what what the the market is for, for that position. And so that's what, when I mentioned earlier, those, those are conversations that are now ongoing in the units and that information is gonna in the, I, in, probably in the next few weeks or so is, is my guess. And then, um, so that's, that's the, for, for this process, so you'll learn at sometime in the next few weeks about what the impact to you individually is. Um, and then, it, Going forward, in the broader sense, um, just like every other non-classified position in, in the future, um, we will make a determination in, in our uh, at a sen as a senior leadership team about what the raise pool is, and that gets distributed across campus. Um, and depending on whether we decide that's COLA or merit, there's different there's different ways to structure that. So it could look a little bit different each year, but but. Um, but would be um, distributed across campus. Great, thank you. Anything, time frame? Oh. I know Lisa was nodding her head yes to ev I everything just, you said. I was gonna say I completely agree. I think we'll um, uniformly walk into the, to the new situation that we'll have July 1, and that will open up flexibility in years to come. So that was gonna be my response as well. Excellent, thanks Lisa. All right, next up, who, who's got a question? Right there. Hi, my name's Matt Irwin. I work in the FAMA electrical department, and I just started here in Octo uh, September. I took a $16,000 a year pay cut to be here because I wanted to work for the U of A. Um, I am now making just over $2 more an hour than I was 13 years ago and that was the max pay you could get as an elect journeyman electrician coming in to work here. I was wondering, because of the pay gap between here and basically everywhere else, what kind of compensation the trades are gonna move up in. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing to work for the University of Arkansas. That's, a, that's another one of those kind of challenging questions about pay gap. Um, how are we thinking about it? Well, I, I think we're thinking about it just like we are the other positions. Uh, what is the work? What is the, what is the work? Take the individual out of the equation. This is about the job and the work. What is the market? That it, 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 the analysis is no different for, for a skilled trade position than it is for any other job. Actually, the, the easier, the, there's a lot more data for skilled trades, actually, so that, that makes it a little bit a little bit easier and less um, um, esoteric, but I think um, we, we will go through that process and uh, um, I'm not sure if your position is classified or not classified right now, um, but <laughs> <laughs> if, 
it's not you'll find out if it's not <laughs> classified there will be i mean obviously uh, the previous answer there there will be a, a a process over the next few weeks that um that you would you would learn how you're impacted about that but uh, if if it's already non-classified then it will be part of this process and we will evaluate it going forward um but your question also makes bring, makes me think about some other things that I want to I, I want to make sure I, I was thinking about what are some of the um, intangibles we were talking about employee value proposition and uh, employer of choice in in broad terms when I think about that here's the things that I think about stability um, we have incredible job stability here. Um, we went through COVID without laying off people. Um, not everybody can say that. Um, I think we, we value our responsibility as a state employer. We take that very seriously. And so we do look, I mean, job stability is one of the greatest benefits, I think, of being an employee of the University of Arkansas. I think p most people have a very predictable schedule. Um, which I'm not sure a lot of employers can, can offer. Um, we also offer a very safe working environment. Um, we do have a, a we, we do care about our employees and, and offer um, all of those things. So, you know, there, there's a value to that too. And so we have to consider that as part of the equation as well, all of those kinds of things as part of the, the equ equation as well. So I just wanted to to add that in, Margaret. Thank you. Really, really helpful um, answer, both on the, you know, the, the compensation piece, but also those intangibles that are hard to articulate. I think you did a great job on that. Thank you. Who's next? been a lot of staff questions. This is an academic one. I'm not personally uh, involved in this conundrum, but I could name perhaps a double handful of people on this campus who are at the associate professor rank, who've given their entire life to this university, but cannot hope to be promoted to professor. If the administration would find an alternative path to that promotion, rather than three outside letters from gosh knows where, it would certainly make a few people very, very happy. Thank you for your comment, which I think is about that associate professor rank. I don't know if you want to uh, respond to that or just take that in its feedback. We have, uh, over the years, I know of several uh, instances where we have provided opportunities and programs for assistant or associate professors to go through to receive additional, I guess, I don't know, training or support in different ways to maybe uh, achieve that rank of professor. The faculty have themselves in our policies defined what are the criteria for promotion to the different levels. The faculty themselves have defined that at the university level, they do it at the college level, and they do it also at the departmental level. There's a criteria for, for those. Uh, if the faculty choose, I don't know if we can go that route. I haven't, I don't know of any of our uh, peer institutions that, that I'm aware of that have alternative routes rather than through the criteria that the, the faculty have established on each individual campus. So, yeah. uh, but we can take a look at it and see if there's other ways in which campuses are addressing this situation. I think Provost Martin, um, you remind us that when we're talking about faculty and employer of choice, shared governance plays a significant role and that that is a conversation for faculty to have and I see a number of deans in the room who have heard that question um, and then there are board of trustees policies um, that govern some of those decisions as well as our own campus policies 
So a, an, a, a good piece of feedback and also um, something that highlights the complexity with which um, our employer of choice initiative is deployed into. Yeah, Anya. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, so we are operating within those structural mm -hmm. constraints and uh, that we would need to change. They're not likely to change, but we can do one thing, which is to be proactive. And I think that from my experience here, 28 years in all the ranks of professorship, I believe that if we are proactive, when a new faculty, when a first day of associate professor, when they come into that position, if we begin to work with them on becoming full professor instead of waiting until later, and can I, why have you been in this rank for let's say 10 years? Ask this question. I think we can be more proactive. And that kind of comes to faculty development, faculty support, mentoring, and recognizing great job that our faculty do in mentoring other faculty in this regard. So, thank you. No, thank you, Anya. Mm -hmm. I think you just pointed out um, kind of that career pathing analog for faculty, right? We've heard Michelle talk and Anne talk about how important career pathing is in this topic, highlights it's the same thing for faculty. So, thank you. Uh, any, I, I think we have time for one more question before we wrap it up. We have in the back here, Logan. Hello, everyone. Um, what is one practical thing we can all do when we leave the room today that will help us move this organization towards the mission of becoming an employer of choice? Thank you so much. That is a terrific question. I'll let you, um, who wants to volunteer? And then I'm going to hit every panelist with that. One thing that we can do as we leave the room today to help make progress towards employer of choice. I'll um, start by saying, um, off, offering to um, start a conversation with your peers or, or the team that you supervise, if you're a supervisor, um, and, and understanding, what, number one, why, why do you choose to be an employer here? There's obviously choices in the marketplace, so why, why do you stay? That's incredible feedback that we could use. Uh, we want to make database decisions, but hearing those that kind of feedback was helpful. I actually, when uh, I, I've received a few emails from people uh, directly as a result of the you know leading up to the town hall with some with some really great feedback, positive and negative. It was very balanced, and I appreciated that. But you know, so what 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 is it that keeps people here, or why did you why do you choose to stay here? And what, what are the things that are, if you, if you had to pick the one thing outside of pay and pay, which obviously we're working on, what is that? What is the one thing you would prioritize? I'd like to know that. Fill my inbox up. <laughs> Seriously. All right, you heard it. Fill that inbox up. You can also use feedback at uark.edu. Uh, <laughs> um, who wants to take that question next? One thing. Michelle? Want to go? Saw that hand go up. It didn't really, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anne took my uh, my answer. Yeah. No, really, I want uh, user stories. We're going to be using those as we uh, try to attract other talents. So, why do we have an electrician who chose to take a pay cut? Why is this my dream job to return? Um, you know, after a long career. I'm a story as well. It's about the impact. Um, I was walking across the street the other day between the diagonal of all the students and a word that came to my mind is vibrant. The welcoming and the family feel that I've already received in the five, six weeks I've been, that's what we're after. So as you go back out and start talking to your teams and your coworkers, uh, why are they here? Why are you here? Great, thanks. Anya? I just want to say one thing, which is we are one team. And, uh, but oftentimes, we don't know how each part of the team contributes. So one thing that we could do today, and not today, just moving forward, is to start talking to other people, asking them how I can help you, and how you can help me. Because I know in faculty affairs, this is the only way I can do my job. Thank you. 
Yes, I, I would <laughs> echo what Ann said. You know, we need to hear uh, some opportunities for improvements. And Jim, I appreciate your question. It's made me think about how we do things, and uh, it is <laughs> ways that we can uh, look at things and we don't always think about it. Sometimes a different twist will, will remind us to do something. And uh, so, send us, talk to your department chair, your dean. I'm going to ask you to fill their inboxes as well. <laughs> but you can send it to me as well. And I, so I just heard the email system crash. <laughs> 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 Chancellor. Uh, in addition to everything that's been said here, I think something more, fu more fundamental is the uh, belief that we, we can become more of an employer of choice to really embrace that, to understand that what you're hearing here is just not words to, you know, fill the air so that, you know, we can have the reporter talk about it in the Arkansas Democratic Gazette. I mean, it's not just so we can look like we're doing something. I actually have been participating in a lot of this, uh, the Huron work on, on class and comp, and it is extraordinarily co complex. And I remember asking the question, because it's expensive too, Ann, I'm, I'm, I must also <laughs> mention. Um, <laughs> I remember I asking the question, well, at the end of all of this, when we get to the promised land of this new class and comp reality at the University of Arkansas, how will people feel about it? That's important to a chancellor, you know. And they were honest, and they said, well, We'll see, We're not really, we hope that people will feel better. But fundamentally, we will be a better organization. And that is the foundation that we must strive to create because we have the responsibility and the opportunity to do that now. I've wondered why hasn't this been done before? I know it's hard and it's expensive. But we are going to do it, and we're going to carry it out to the best of our ability, and there'll be mistakes made, challenges, things that we'll have to continue to do because it's a process, a process in which we will evolve to more, to more and better. And it requires each and every one of you to, at the most basic place, to believe that we can do it and to give feedback as has been mentioned, that helps us to continue to shape this environment in a way that reflects the values that we all embrace. And so I really do, I mean, I know hope is not a strategy, but it's extraordinarily <laughs> important to the foundations of moving an organization. And I want each of you to have the hope and belief that we are serious about this work and we're going to do everything we can to change this landscape for the better. Thank you, Chancellor. I think um, you know those are those are the the wise words of um, what we often tell our students. Right? Some of the best work is the hard work. It's how we learn. It's how we grow. And this isn't easy. I think we we all recognize that it's not easy to work through these issues. But I'm really pleased that um, to see a panel that's willing to take on the tough issues and challenges, and not just say, "Well, maybe it will get better. We'll hope it gets better." Um, and and that means that we're a proactive organization that's always trying to improve. Um, so, Anne, you know, any any kind of final call to action for the group? That last question was a great one about what can we do. Um, today, going out of the room, any other thoughts as we close out today? Um, yeah, I think I just remind everybody that we all play a role in this, and we all have a responsibility, especially those of us who are supervisors, to start the work now. Even Don't wait for somebody to tell you. You can think about what you heard today and uh, think about what you're doing in your own department or your, in, in your own area to, to uh, make this a great place to work for, for individuals. So that's what, that's what I'd leave it with. Awesome, thank you. Um, so let me just wrap up quickly. Um, again, thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to people who submitted questions. Thanks to those of you who um, are watching live. 
what you can look for next. Uh, we'll have some draft pillars and goals in April for the community to digest and think about. Look for um, follow-on forums, in particular one on data strategy that will help you understand how we're thinking about those data questions. Um, I have to mention that there's an investiture of our chancellor on April 20th um, in which you'll hear a lot of these themes, right? We'll be talking about research excellence, student success, employer of choice, because that's what you're focused on. And so thank you for making the time for the community to actually have these conversations. Um, and then we'll also have some virtual sessions um, with EAB for our unit level um, because you'll be engaged in kind of what comes next. What does it mean in engineering or in Fulbright or in bumpers or in the grad school, um, in the law school, and whoever I forgot. Walton, I know wherever you are. Uh, I'm thinking of you too and Cohab. Kate, you're back there. Excellent. Um, what, it, what life do you breathe in to these strategic pillars and our goals from the unit level up. So we'll have that kind of from the highest level and then also from our units who are so powerful in alignment around these strategic pillars. Um, so with a name like Margaret McCabe, I have to say happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, <laughs> I also have to say go hogs. And I also have to say have a great spring break, um, even if you're hanging out on campus like I am, you know, the next week is a little breathing room for everybody. So thank you again for being here, and thanks to our panel for thinking about being an employer of choice and taking action on it. Thank you.